One of the most famous of these efforts took place in 1963, when the Mona Lisa was lent to the American people by the government of the French Republic as a gesture of friendship and diplomacy. After the painting's initial exhibition at the National Gallery in Washington, it arrived at the Met with its own Secret Service security detail. The exhibition advanced the Metropolitan's vision of public art education and was considered successful, though the large volume of visitors minimized the educational experience. Irrespective of this, the sheer number of visitors provided the museum with an important new tool in the ongoing struggle to obtain funding from the city. During the 1960s and 1970s, large exhibitions were to become a key component of museum business plans and marketing strategies, and the Metropolitan was in the forefront of this development. In a large part, this was due to Thomas Hoving, who succeeded Jim Rorimer in 1967. Hoving's first task at the Metropolitan was to organize at short notice a show to fill a gap in the schedule formed by the postponement of another exhibition. Titled, In the Presence of Kings, Royal Treasures from the Collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The exhibition was drawn almost entirely from the Met's own collection and included more than 600 objects spanning 5,000 years of the world's uh, civilizations. The exhibition was lauded for its then experimental thematic approach to the permanent collection and for its innovative design, which, in which included curved walls, niches, custom pedestals, and dramatic lighting. Hoving also brought fresh energy, energy to the Metropolitan's engagement with contemporary art. But the exhibition was pivotal in stimulating debate regarding the significance of artists from the New York School, and it levered the Metropolitan into the contemporary art scene from which the institution had been largely absent for decades. Meanwhile, as another historian of the museum, Michael Gross, has recently commented, Hoving realized that the more the museum was criticized, the more the crowds streamed in. By the mid-70s, the scale and variety of exhibitions that has characterized the Metropolitan's museum program over the last 30 years was well established. For example, 1975 began with a show celebrating the 100th birthday of Impressionism, which was followed by exhibits of Japanese art, Francis Bacon, Scythian gold from the Soviet Union, the opening of the Lehman Pavilion, and a scholarly exhibit of French paintings organized in conjunction with the Louvre. The Met had been lobbying Washington since 1972 for the creation of a government-backed indemnity program and the Scythian show became the first test case, being awarded a one-time congressional legislation to ensure the works of art in transit. The Soviet government reciprocated by indemnifying American and European paintings that were sent overseas in exchange. And the success of this two-way effort paved the way for the establishment later in 1975 of a permanent indemnity program managed by the National Endowment for the Arts. Since that time, the indemnity program has ensured nearly 900 exhibitions several in America, several dozen of them at the Metropolitan, saving hundreds of millions of dollars for the museums in insurance premiums. Another of the innovations that occurred under Thomas Hoving were the annual costume exhibitions organized by Diana Vreeland, the curator of the Costume Institute. Hoving left the Metropolitan Museum in 1977 to be succeeded by Philippe de Montebello, who obviously needs no introduction in this context. Philippe's appointment as director signaled a retreat from the showy extravagance and publicity stunts of Hoving's directorship. And in the coming years, the Metropolitan was to craft a more nuanced balance between business realities and scholarly mission. 
but the roster of major international loan exhibitions continued unabated. During the late 70s and 80s, the Met hosted many groundbreaking exhibitions of European art. Indeed, the number of exhibitions that the Met mounted each year has steadily increased. During the 1970s, we mounted an average of 25 exhibitions and installations each year. In the 1980s, that number rose to 28. I show uh, some of the, the changing banners on the facade of the museum from the 80s. In the 1990s, the number rose to 37 each year. And we have again images from the 1990s. And in the early 2000s, uh, sorry, we rose 28 to 35 to 37. <clears throat> Last year it was 40. There you see the, the new banners that were introduced about four, three years ago as a result of the cleaning of the facade. Less theatrical than the enormous ones, but um, considerably cheaper. And they allow you to actually see the, the architecture. One of the driving forces behind this increase in the number of exhibitions um, has been the growth of the museum itself. Philippe de Montebello's tenure coincided with the realization of the master plan that Hoving had negotiated with the city for the museum back in the 1970s, when he, he uh, reached an agreement to massively extend the footprint of the museum. Here we see the museum before the building, before the master plan, and completed in 1991, there is the museum as it now exists today. In 1985, Philippe appointed Marouk Tarapour, I know a good friend of, 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 of many of you here in, at the Prado, um, as a special assistant to the director for exhibitions. And subsequently, she became the associate director for exhibitions. Since the mid-1980s, Marouk played a key role in negotiating loans and developing relationships with sister institutions all over the world.